Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We are in the uh, bunker barn this morning. Praise the Father. It's not 112 degrees in here yet, uh, but we are going to read his word. We are in Leviticus 23, which is the chapter for biblical feasts. I imagine we are only going to get Leviticus 23 this morning. If we were just going to read the words here, we could get 23 and 24 probably without an issue. However, we're not going to just read because there's so much here. We have seven feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, um, Shavuot, Trumpets, Atonement, and Sukkot. And I want to give you a little bit of background and a little bit of context and reference for each of these feasts and explain to you to the best of my ability my conviction to do these feasts um, and we do we keep these feasts uh, and we keep these feasts not because uh, we are a works-based theology or bound by legalism but because the Father tells us in his word to do these for all of our generations, and we still have generations. Uh, we believe first and foremost in Yeshua as Messiah, the anointed of the Most High, and that we have salvation only by believing in his name, on his name, and through his atoning sacrifice. We also keep the Torah to the best of our ability. Can't keep it perfectly, that's why we have a Messiah. Not saying we can uh, but as we've discussed here before, knowing where the boundaries are on the playing field of life gives you a much better sense of when you're getting out of bounds, when you're moving forward, when you're moving back, and you can self-regulate. And that's what the Torah does for me. It allows me to self-regulate based upon uh, laws that were given by the Father to Moses. It's not Moses' law. It's the Father's law. The law of Moses was nailed to the cross. That's cool. I'd love to see that passage if you could send it to me. That'd be great. Uh, in the meanwhile, <laughs> we're going to read the words of our creator as given to Moses here in Leviticus 23. And hopefully y'all will see how this uh, dovetails beautifully into biblical prophecy and our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. So we're in Leviticus 23, Waikra 23, uh, being serenaded by all the lovely roosters outside. Let's just go ahead and get into it. 23, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, That's us, we are the children of Israel. We've talked about this repeatedly, but it bears repeating. If you are a Gentile, which most of us are, and you are grafted into the tree of life, you cannot graft a branch into a tree without rootstock, or it will die. Okay? The tree of life is Israel. The end. That's not like up for debate. The tree of life is Israel. So, moving on. The children of Israel, us. Hey, Moshe, speak to us. Got it? Okay. And say to them, the appointed times of Yahweh, Yahuwah, which you are to proclaim as set apart gatherings, as holy convocations. My appointed times are these. Six days work is done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a set-apart gathering. You do no work. It is a Sabbath to Yahweh in all your dwellings. Gosh, we could talk for an hour just about that. Uh, we don't have an hour to talk just about that, so here's the deal. This is a double-edged sword. The one side of it is, on the seventh day, you rest. You do no work. Well, what's work? Um, anything you get paid to do is work. And our benchmark around here is anything that makes me go, ugh. ugh. 
If I'm doing something on Shabbat and I go, I stop doing it, I set it down and I walk away. And I get a better and better feel in the doing of as for what that is, right? So I know what makes me go ug and I know what doesn't make me go ug. Um, so that's the one hand. The other hand is, and this is much less often talked about. Is that even a phrase? Much less often? It is now. You're welcome. Six days work is done. Six days work is done. You know, I get a question repeatedly from many, many, many viewers, both on the spiritual side and the preparedness side. How do I get out of debt? Well, step one, six days work is done. Six days. Not three and a half days, not five days. Six days work is done. So the Shabbat, Sabbath, the command here is the double-edged sword. You will not work on the Sabbath. You will work every other day. The end. Not because Moses said, but because Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and earth, who manifested himself in Messiah, said. Okay? Six days work is done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a set-apart gathering. You do no work. It is a Sabbath to Yahweh and all your dwellings. These are the appointed times of Yahweh, set apart gatherings, which you are to proclaim at their appointed times. In the first new moon, on the 14th day of the new moon, between the evenings is Pesach, is the Pesach to Yahweh. What the H-E double hockey sticks is Pesach. All right. And the first day of the blah, 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 blah. All right. The Hebrew calendar is not the Greco-Roman calendar. It, they do not do this well. They kind of do this well because the words are tremendous. Long and short, if you just Google the appointed times 2019 or 2020, or whatever, you can get somebody much smarter than me who has done all the work. <laughs> Press print, hang it on your wall. That's what we do, okay? Um, Cause yeah, there's, there's a considerable amount of work there. I'm not an astronomer or an astrologer or a guy who holds an astrolabe and looks at stars. I'm none of that, okay? I got none of that. <laughs> Yet-ish, question mark. So, right now, while we can Google, we should, and I guess we should get a much better feel for what that looks like when we can't Google, because long and short, I don't know, okay? But the first month is Nissan, like, you know, the car company. And so, here you go. In the first new moon, on the 14th day of the new moon, between the evenings, is the Pesach to Yahweh. So the 14th of the first month, Nisan, is Passover, Pesach. Okay. And, uh, ba -da -ba -da. and on the 15th day, the very next day of this new moon, is the festival of matzah to Yahweh. Seven days you eat unleavened bread. That's the festival of unleavened bread. On the first day, you have a set-apart gathering. You party it up, man, and you do no servile work. And you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh for seven days. On the seventh day is a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. Okay, so, okay. That seems straightforward enough. Let's go ahead here. I need something as a bookmark. We will use BZK antiseptic towelettes from a first aid kit right there. All right. Passover represents liberation from slavery. By the way, if you don't have paper and a pen, Get some paper and a pen so you can take some notes if you're interested in this, okay? If you're not, whatever. Or you can refer back to this video at a later time. But I would recommend writing these things down 
and sticking them in your Bible so that you have them. And I will be sticking these notes in my Bible at Leviticus 23. So as time rolls on, if ever the Google machine is busted, um, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, I will have my notes on these feasts so that I can carry on in the traditions commanded by, Mo by Yahweh for me to carry on in. So, all right. Passover. Exodus 12. Flip over there. Okay, T. Thanks, guys. No problem, T. Exodus 12. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This new moon is the beginning of new moons for you. It is the first new moon of the year. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this new moon, one of them is to take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house, according to the number of beings, according to each man's need, you take account for a lamb." Let the lamb be a perfect one, a year old male. Take from it a sheep or from, take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same new moon. Then the assembly of the congregation of Israel shall slay it between evenings. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire its head and its legs and its inward parts. And do not leave of it until morning and what remains of it until morning you are to burn with fire. This is how you eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Pesach, the Passover of Yahweh. And I shall pass through the land of Mitzrayim on that night, and shall strike all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both man and beast. And on all the mighty ones of Mitzrayim I shall execute judgment. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I shall pass over you and let the plague not come on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Mitzrayim. And this day shall become to you a remembrance and you shall celebrate it as the festival to Yahweh throughout your generations. Celebrate it as a festival and everlasting law. Okay. Now... Exodus 12, Passover. There are readings that go with this when you celebrate Passover. Okay, so note time. Exodus 12, 21 through 51, which we just read a healthy portion of. Numbers 28, 16 to 25. Joshua 3, 5 to 7. Joshua 5, 2 to 6, 1, and Joshua 6, 27. Okay, yeah, you may have to rewind this a couple of times in your note taking, and I will try to put all this down in the description, no promises, but I will try, okay? Coffee is fabulous. All right. Sorry, that's not in the Bible. It should be, though. Hmm. The Revised Bear Version. The Book of Bear. Verily I say unto thee, coffee is fabuloso. All right. Now, what does all this point to? See, that's the thing. And this is probably going to be a long video. Don't care. Sorry. What does all this point to? Yeshua. Okay. The blood. I will pass you over for judgment. Okay, let's turn to the book of John. You may, might have heard of him. He's one of those New Testament guys. He's, uh, his book is after Luke. In the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah. So we're going to go to John 5, 5 to 4, 5 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me possesses everlasting life and does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Does not come into judgment. Is passed over for judgment. Then you could also go to John 8, 36. 
John 8, 36. Come on now, eyeballs. If then the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Yep. Okay. The fulfillment here, man, is Messiah. So, there's some huge prophecy and huge biblical metaphors throughout these feasts, okay? Passover has been fulfilled. We have our Passover lamb. It was Yeshua. He had no broken bones. He was perfect without blemish. His blood, his atoning sacrifice is what has allowed him to become the mediator of a renewed covenant between us and the Father. If you don't love that terminology, I would implore you to read Hebrews 8, 6, 8, 8, and 8, 10. Okay? Yeshua is the mediator, 8, 6, of a renewed covenant, renewed covenant, 8, 10, and 8, I'm sorry, 8, 8, and 8, 10. Our half of the bargain is that these laws get written on our heart. Okay? That's how all that works, which is great because now we have a way to shed the, the just destructive weight of our sin and our shame and this disaster of a life that we can make for ourselves, get rid of all of that because belief in Messiah separates us from our sin as far as the East is from the West. And then we can seek the face of the Father. Okay? Messiah himself said, no one comes to the Father but through me. Boy, is he correct. And we should all rejoice every day that when we do Passover, we do Passover as a remembrance, not because we need the blood of this lamb so that we don't suffer and die because of our sins, because somebody has already suffered and died. The king of the world has already suffered and died for our sins. Okay. Moving on. Got to find my handy wipes here. Okay. That's Passover. So we got uh, verse 9, 23, 9, Leviticus 23, 9. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh for your acceptance. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. And on that day when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a male, a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one, as an ascending offering to Yahweh. And its grain offering, two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, a sweet fragrance, and its drink offering, one-fourth of a hin of wine. And you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. A law forever. Just going to maybe foot stomp that one more time. A law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. This has not been done away with. Okay? A law forever. And this is why I implore you guys to read your Bible with me. I want you to see the Father's words. Not my words. These are not nice things that I made up. Okay? And these are not things that are talked about in the modern Christian church. Hell, they're not talked about in the Christian church in general. Over the last couple thousand years. Yet here it is, right in our Bible, smacking us in the face. Right? Which is why we should all take personal responsibility for our relationship with our Messiah and our Creator and read their words daily so that they can speak to us and tell us how we are to conduct ourselves, including this right here, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Forever. Okay. Remember, brother T. Not pastor T, brother T. Okay. Maybe Pastor T one day, not there yet. My prayer has been for months now, Father, train me. Whatever it is you need me to do, train me up to do it, and I will do it. But uh, 
I am not at all comfortable calling myself a pastor. Question mark, yet, question mark. We'll see what happens. Uh, when the Father draws me into that, if the Father draws me into that, I will go and I will go willingly if it's his will. Otherwise, I am happy and contented to continue doing what I am doing now, and I am blessed in the doing of it. So, unleavened bread. The feast, uh, what am I doing here? All right, we didn't even talk about unleavened bread yet. Okay, good. Unleavened bread. Let's go back here just a little bit. The festival of matzah. Here we have uh, 23 6. And on the 15th day of this new moon is the festival of matzah, which is unleavened bread. So that's 15 Nisan, uh, the month of Nisan, day 15, for seven days. Okay. And uh, leavening is akin to sin. Okay. Uh, you may have heard, I've heard this in church, and I've heard my pastor talk about this recently. Well, a little leavening leavens the whole bunch, right? Thinking that if you're trying to raise funds for something, we put a little bit in the pot. That leaven, that will leaven the pot and bring more money. Leaven is sin, okay? So that's not how that phrase is used. A little leavening leavens the whole bunch. Negative. <laughs> uh, it does. It corrupts all of it, right? So that would not be the phrase that I would use for fundraising. Now, that being said, leavening is akin to sin. And the reason that we eat unleavened bread for a week is in remembrance of this Passover and this exodus from Mitzrayim as the Hebrews had to flee from Egypt, Mitzrayim. Okay? They, they left in such a hurry that they didn't have time for their bread to rise because at the time, yeast was... There wasn't little packets of yeast that you made bread with. Yeast, to this day, floats around in the air. Uh, and they didn't have their dough out to catch the yeast so that it would rise. They didn't have time for that, so they made unleavened bread. Which, BT dubs, is delish if you make it properly. Uh, we enjoy it. We make it on, pa on Passover and during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then we make it regularly i probably make it once a month and it keeps for keeps for a week in a ziploc on the counter and then you can absolutely freeze it and heat it up again in a hot oven so which just based upon the laws of thermodyna thermodynamics if the oven wasn't hot it would be hard to heat it up so take that and put it over here all right so you get all the sin out, right? You spend a week of being intentional. And what's cool about this is you actually think quite a bit. If you if you think about leavening a sin and then you go to try and eat something, it's like, oh, Cocoa Puffs can't have that or Corn Pops or bread or I'll just have some croutons on my salad. And no, I won't. And there's leavening in that. And you become very aware and it becomes kind of this mental hide and seek game of, what sin am I hiding in my life that I don't look at, that I don't go looking for with a fine tooth comb, right? And so it's a remembrance and it's a reminder. Uh, so we can see this again in Exodus twelve fifteen, which we just read a moment ago. The readings for the Feast of Unleavened Bread is Psalms 113 through 118, one per day. Halal, it's called, okay? One per day. So you read Psalms 113 the first day, then 114, then 115, then so forth and so on. 113 through 118. You should write that down. Now, the fulfillment for this is, drum roll please, Yeshua. All right. So let's flip back to John just for a hot minute. Can his fat thumbs do the walk-in? Come on, come on. There it is. Book of John. And uh, that would be before the book of Acts. Go to John 6. Again. All right. So we got John 6. 48. Come on, eyeballs. John 6, 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of the heavens so that anyone might eat of it and not die. I am the living bread 
which came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And indeed, the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Yep, there you go. So John 6, 48 right there is the fulfillment of unleavened bread. And then we can also, let's see, we got a couple other references. Go to John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That little parable there saying, you know, Yeshua was uh, died, buried, and resurrected, and bore much fruit. Okay, that's the parable there. So, a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. And then from there, you get much more wheat as it grows up again. So... I have that in my notes as well. And then lastly here, hold on, I gotta put my, my wipes back in the page, is 1 Corinthians 5, 8. If you can find 1 Corinthians, it's in all these letters that everybody wrote to everybody else. 1 Corinthians 5, 8. So then let us celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, nor the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Therefore, cleanse out the old leaven, so that you are a new lump, as you are unleavened, as you are unleavened without sin. Check that out. For also Messiah, our Passover, our Pesach, was slaughtered for us. It's just amazing to me when people say the Old Testament's for the Jews, the New Testament's for the Christians, and never shall the two meet. It's like, guys, it's in the same binding for a reason. Like, they constantly cross-pollinate and inform each other, and that's the beauty of it. Um, yeah, so that's unleavened bread. Now we can go to first fruits. We talked about first fruits um, over here. Wrong bookmark. Sorry, I didn't mean to skip over unleavened bread, but I did. So that got things a little sideways there. First fruits, um, which we did read about here. A law forever throughout your generations. So we can flip to Leviticus 23.10, which is where we are right now. Where it says, speak to the children of Israel and you shall say to them, when they come to the land which I give you and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Okay, there are no prescribed readings for first fruits. First fruits is the day after the Passover holiday. Okay, so we got Pesach, Passover, then unleavened bread, then first fruits. It's just kind of this whoosh, block of, of party time. Okay, and then the fulfillment here on first fruits. You guys are going to hate my guts on this one. There's a lot of flipping. 1 Corinthians. Flippity flip flip, yo. That's how they said it back in the day. Not Colossians. I don't want Colossians. Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. I feel like Marlo beat me to that one. She can flip faster than I can. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit of those having fallen asleep. For since death is through a man, resurrection of the dead is also through a man. Capital M. For as all die in Adam, so also shall all be made alive in Messiah. And each in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, then those who are of Messiah at his coming. Okay, 1 Corinthians. Again, it's like saying, well, you know, all that stuff was done away with at the cross. Was it, I mean, was it, honestly, was it? Not that I can see, not from actually reading my own Bible. I've had pastors and ministers who have told me that. I'm having a hell of a hard time myself finding that. And a lot of that comes from people misunderstanding Paul, the law of sin and death. The Father who fearfully and wonderfully created you in his image and has a perfect plan for your life did not create a law of sin and death for you. That's absurd. We can read elsewhere in this good that elsewhere in this word that all that is good comes from the Father. Yet he created a law of sin and death for you? No, that's theological bullcrap. 
that's people not wanting to be under the authority of the Father and abusing the grace of the Son. Okay, moving right along. Easter, one of the biblical feasts that you won't find in this book because it doesn't exist on a biblical basis. Uh, so as a brief aside, I would implore you to do some research on your own, a little Bible work, a little Google work, maybe a little YouTube video work. Easter is a pagan fertility holiday. Yes, Easter is a pagan fertility holiday that predates the death and resurrection of Messiah. And it was co-opted by the early Roman Catholic Christian Church-ish question mark. Uh, to bring pagans into the fold, to consolidate power, i.e. wealth, okay? Just like the day of worship got changed to Sunday. Oh, you worship the sun on your day? How about you worship the son of God on this day as well? Oh, sounds good. Okay, all right. And so there's a lot of that that's going on that I would just, don't take my word for it, go research it. Okay, but Easter comes from the German Teutonic word Eustra, Eustra, okay, which is the word for Ishtar, which is the Babylonian fertility lowercase g goddess. And uh, why fertility? I don't know. Bunnies um, reproduce like bunnies. They got the jackhammer thing down and uh, eggs, fertility. Do I, I mean, do I need to get out a whiteboard and start sketching here, ladies and gentlemen? The whole thing is based around fertility and we are told repeatedly, especially throughout Genesis and Exodus, that fertility is the dominion of the father and he hates those that engage in pagan rituals including Easter. Now, elsewhere we can read in this Bible that, that Messiah himself celebrated Easter, except that he didn't. The word there is Pesach. And it's translated everywhere else in the Bible as Pesach, except for one time in the New Testament where it was, in my estimation, intentionally translated as Easter to set the groundwork for the adoption of the Easter tradition within the newly forming church. But if we apply just a little bit of logic, please explain to me how Messiah was celebrating his own death and resurrection with his guys before he died. What? Yeshua and all of his taught ones, his disciples, were sitting around celebrating Easter, which is the celebration of his death and resurrection, before he died and resurrected? No, they weren't. They were celebrating Passover, and there is no biblical foundation for Easter. There is doctrines and dogmas of man within a 2,000-year-ish tradition of keeping pagan holidays under the guise of Christianity for Easter, but it's not biblical. Moving on. Gosh, I just lost all the views. Everybody hates my guts now. And I'm man, I used to celebrate Easter, used to celebrate Christmas, used to do all of those things. The more I read my Bible, the more I realized not only is this not what we're supposed to do, the Father tells us he hates it when we do it. I don't want that guy mad at me. He, um, I don't know if you've heard of a couple of cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. But I don't want to be on the receiving end of that wrath. Not interested. Which is another thing. The glory of the Lord. Uh, Shekinah. Yeah. I long for the coming of the glory of the Lord. Do you read your Bible? When the glory of the Lord comes, people die profusely. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I want to conduct my life in such a way that I never have to experience the glory of the Lord. I really don't want to be consumed by fire or smote into a pillar of ash because I did not take the time to read his word and understand it and pray for clarity and wisdom and guidance. Uh, yeah. Shavuot, moving on. Let's go back to Leviticus. 
where you had a bookmark, hopefully. Leviticus 23, 23, 15. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, so from first fruits, you shall count for yourselves seven complete Sabbaths. So seven weeks. Seven times seven is 38. Yay, public school. No, 49. <laughs> yeah, 49. <laughs> 49 days until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. And then you add a day, the morrow after the tomorrow of the seventh Sabbath. You count 50 days, 50. Then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahweh. 50. Penta. Pentecost. Shavuot. Pentecost. The counting of 50 days. You start counting the Omer, the daily count, on the 16th of Nisan. You count for 50 days. So seven Sabbaths plus a day. So Peshach, I'm sorry, Shavuot will always land on a first day or a Sunday, as the world calls it, because the Sabbath is always on a Saturday, as the world calls it. Sater day. You know, those guys that are half man, half goat body things, and they have played the little harp and they you know, live in the woods and hang out with fairies. Satyrs also revered by pagans for their fertility and their wisdom and their ability to play tricks on humans. That's where you get Saturday from. Seder day. You're welcome. Okay. So, the morrow after the Sabbath, bring from your dwellings for a wave offering two loaves of bread, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour. They are baked with leaven, first fruits to Yahweh. And besides the bread, you shall bring seven lambs, a year old perfect ones, and a young bull and two rams. They are an ascending offering to Yahweh with their grain offering, their drink offerings, offerings made by fire for a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And you shall offer one male goat as a sin offering and two male lambs, a year old, as a slaughter of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them besides the bread of the first fruit as a wave offering before Yahweh. Besides the two lambs, they are set apart to Yahweh for the priests. So we, we've got a little bit going on here. You're going to bring a wave offering of some bread. And then besides the bread, you're going to bring seven lambs a year old, perfect ones, which means without blemish, meaning they're not all jacked up with busted legs and ear mites and, you know, the runs. And one young bull and two rams. They're an ascending offering to Yahweh, okay? Like a peace offering. With their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And you shall offer one male goat as a sin offering, and two male lambs, a year old, as slaughter of peace offerings. The peace offerings, that's to feed the priests. Okay? So we got a whole bunch of food and offering going on here. So we got bread, we got wine, we got flour, we've got animals. And the priest shall wave them besides the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Yahweh. Besides the two lambs, they are set apart to Yahweh for the priest. And on the same day, you shall proclaim a set apart gathering for yourselves. Do no servile work on it. A law forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. We should underline that. A law forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Oh, good news, the chickens are here. So, okay, so that's the end of this discussion here about Shavuot. Okay, we don't have a temple anymore. We don't have a priest anymore. We have a high priest in Yeshua. He is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, who I would say Melchizedek was Yeshua Old Testament style. Yeah, that's a good stretch. Okay. But that is literally another video for another time. In fact, we covered that in Genesis. So if you're curious about that, you can go back to Genesis and, and see about that. But uh, yeah, we got a whole playlist of all this stuff. It's the Shabbat playlist here on this channel. So if you haven't watched all of these videos, Feel free to. If the spirit moves, you go for it. So Shavuot, we count 50 days, right? And we end up on the 50th day, we get what's called the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost or the Feast of Summer Harvest. 
The prescribed readings for this are Exodus 19, 1 through 20. I'm sorry, Exodus 19, 1 through 20, 23. Okay, so this is a long reading. And Ezekiel 1, 1 through 28. And Ezekiel 3, 12. Now, what's the fulfillment here? What is this feast pointing to? Because all these, pe these feasts are prophetic. They point forward in time to something. Which is why the keeping of these feasts, even if, well, we don't have to do that anymore. And I'm sorry if I use an accent that is obnoxious to you. Um, I don't mean to insult anybody, but just suffice it to say, I've had Southern Baptists spit and kick me. Spit on me and kick me because of my convictions. I'm like, okay, you guys got that love your neighbor as yourself stuff down. Great. Thanks. Um... Raised in the conservative Baptist church, spent some time in the Lutheran church, visited Mormon churches, visited um, Catholic churches, Pentecostal, apostolic churches. Um, yeah. Messianic. I just keep the way. I do what the Bible says to do. The end. Call it what you want. Hebrew roots, although the Hebrew roots terminology is being adopted by a bunch of racist militants now, says me. So, I just do what the Bible says to do, man. Anyway, the fulfillment here. Let's go to, this is a very interesting thing. Go to Exodus 32, 19. Exodus 32, 19. Exodus 32, 19. <clears throat> and it came to be as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. This is Moshe coming down after having received the law from the father. And Moshe's displeasure burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it into powder and scattered it on the face of the water and made the children of Israel drink it. And he said to Aaron, what did the people do that you have brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, yo, chill out, man. And Moshe said, bro, I told you not to do this. The father said not to do this. And uh, <clears throat> they threw the gold in the fire and blah, blah, blah. And see, here's the other thing, too. Aaron was, I've talked about this before. Aaron was an anointed, the anointed priest of the Most High. And he still messed up. Right? Which is why you do not take your pastor's word or your priest's word or anybody's word as gospel. You do your own research. And it's not that you don't love your pastor, your priest, or whoever. It's that it's this relationship is between you and the Father, not between you and your pastor. And your pastor's not going to be standing there next to you on Judgment Day saying, Well, yeah, my bad, I told him that. In fact, James implores us in the book of James, My brothers, let not many amongst you be teachers. Because there's very few of you who actually get it. <clears throat> Probably myself included. As I've said many a time, I will fail you. How do I know that? Because even with the best of intentions, I'm a human being. That means I'm going to mess this up. Get out of here, chicken. Nobody wants to hear you. So, I'm going to make a mess of this sooner or later, whether I intend to or not. I don't intend to, but I'm human. I'm going to mess up. Aaron made the golden calf, okay? Aaron, the high priest, made the golden calf. That should tell you something about how much trust you should put in the words of man versus the words of the father. I think I need to shoot that chicken. Okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway, what we're getting at here is Moshe stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Who is for Yahweh? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him. And he said to them, Thus said Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, your God. Each one put his sword on his side, pass over to and fro from the gate, from gate to gate in the camp. And each one kill his brother, and each one his friend, and each one his relative. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moshe. And about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So 3,000 people got killed, Exodus uh, 
32 because of their transgression. Now, let's go to Acts 2. The book of Acts, Acts 2. Where's all my Pentecostals at? I know you guys know this book. Probably word for word, most of you. All right, chicken. You and me are not going to work out. I hate to break it to you, but you're kind of annoying. It, it really is you. It's not me. Oh, my gosh. There's another one up there. Okay. Maybe that's where they've been laying. I'll have to tell my wife. How interesting. Huh. The very first line in Acts 2. And when the day of the festival of Shavuot had come, they were all in all with one mind in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from the heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And, it, and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and settled on each one of them. And they were all filled with the set-apart spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave to them to speak. Now, I'm going to break uh, some, some rough news to you guys here. They did not start speaking in blah, blah, blahs. They were speaking their native language. They were heard in the native language of others who did not speak the same language. So in the Pentecostal church, one of the proofs of somebody having received the Holy Spirit is that they speak in tongues. And I know people who have left the church because they've never been able to speak in tongues because clearly they don't have the Spirit. I would remind you guys that that is not the only gift of the Spirit. And then when you are speaking in tongues, it does not mean nonsense is falling out of your face and other people are understanding you. It means that I'm speaking English, and if Russian is your mother language, you're hearing me speak in Russian, even though English is coming out of my mouth. That's the gift of speaking in tongues from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Shazam! All right. Moving on. But here we have an Acts 2, 40 and 41. Go there for a hot minutin. Um, and with many other words, he earnestly witnessed and urged them, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. Then those indeed who gladly received his word were immersed. And on that day, about 3,000 beings were added to them. So the kingdom lost 3,000, and then we added 3,000. So... There is a cute little Bible thing for you. That's Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And it's fulfilled by the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh here in Acts 2. Okay? And again, there are many gifts of the Spirit. And there's more than one proof of having received the Spirit. Speaking in tongues is not the only proof. I've never spoken in tongues that I know of. Never. And if someone was to confront me and say that I do not have the gift of the Holy Spirit, I would remind them wisdom and discernment. And then I would judge them by their fruits and I would ask them to judge me by my fruits. And if I'm found lacking, so be it. But ultimately, it's not a man's opinion that I'm concerned with. My goal is to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, when I shuffle off this mortal coil. And there's only one being in the history of the universe that can utter that phrase to me. And it's not you. And it's not my mom. It's not my dad. It's not my best friend. It's not my pastor. It's not anybody else. It's not even me. It's my creator, the most high. <clears throat> Going back to Leviticus 23. Okay, 23, 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corners of your field. When you reap, you do not gather any gleaning from your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Story of Ruth there. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, this is 23, 23. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh new moon, on the first day of the new moon, you have a rest, a remembrance of Tarura. Tarura, Tarua, a set apart gathering. You do no servile work and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, okay, that's the Feast of Trumpets right there, which is um, Leviticus 23, 23 and 24. What is trumpets? Well, it depends on who you ask, but traditionally speaking, trumpets is, trumpets 
is a remembrance of Yah's grace and provision towards Abraham when he supplied, he being the father, supplied the ram for the sacrifice rather than Isaac. Um, also seen oftentimes nowadays as uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. And this is the month of Tishri, the first month, the first day of the month of Tishri. The seventh new moon, which is the seventh month, on the first day of that new moon, first of Tishri, you have this uh, Trumpets Festival. There are readings for this that are prescribed. That'd be Genesis 21, all of it, Numbers 29, 1 through 6, and 1 Sam 1, 1 and 2, and then 1 Sam 1, 10. That is the reading for trumpets. Now, what is the point of all of this? Okay. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. You guys probably hate my guts. <laughs> That's okay. If you need to take this in pieces, drips and drabs, go for it. 1 Corinthians 15.52. Come on, fingers. Romans, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, see, here we go. See, I speak a secret to you. We shall not all sleep and we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible has to put on incorruption. For this corruptible has to put on incorruption and this mortal to be immorality. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall come to be the word that has been written, death is swallowed up in overcoming, which is Isaiah 25, 8. O death, where is your sting? And the sting of death is in sin and the power of the sin is in the Torah. But thanks to Elohim, who gives us the overcoming through Master Yeshua Messiah. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Master, knowing that your labor is not in vain to the Master. And just to be clear here, the power of the sin is in the Torah. That, that does not mean that the Torah is sin. It means that the Torah allows you to know what sin is, which we can glean from 1 John uh, 3, 4, which literally says sin is transgression of Torah. Okay? Okay. Cool. But this trumpet here, the sounding of this trumpet, this is a last day's prophecy, meaning that as this time comes, we're trumpeting in this change that's coming when the dead shall be raised. Okay? This is last day's prophecy. This has not happened yet. Not that I know of. I don't know. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. I think on an individual level, when we receive Messiah, that happens. As far as the kingdom goes, nah, we're not there yet. Uh, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Yes, yes, more flipping. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Because the master himself shall come down from heavens with a shout, with the voice of the chief messenger, and with the trumpet of Elohim, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Then we, the living who are left over, shall be caught away together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air. And so we shall always be with the master. So then encourage one another with these words. That has not happened yet. But that's why trumpets is important, because it points toward that, the coming of that. And good. Now we're on to atonement. So let's go to, and, and listen guys, I'm cruising here because we're already an hour deep and we've got two more feasts to get through. But I would encourage you to go deeper and study on any and all of these and really to just start doing them because it, there's wonderful things happen when you do them. Uh, 
for example, the Feast of First Fruits, the first time I did the Feast of First Fruits, we did it here on property, and I took the first harvest, harvest from our garden here, and I built a very small altar out of stone. It was tiny, just because, just some stacked stones, not cut stones, stacked stones, because I had an urging of the spirit to do it, and I built a small fire, and I burned a portion of our first harvest here to the Father. And I sat on my knees in front of this altar, and I prayed, and I wept, and I felt the spirit move, and it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful moment. It was a moment of deep connection with the Father. Deeper than I've ever had in a church. I just put it that way. I felt close. I had my eyes closed and I was just praying and tears were just streaming down my face. And I, it, it felt like there were angels standing next to me with their hands on my shoulders, just chilling with me. I could feel a presence right there with me. Uh, it was beautiful. It, it was communing with my creator. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And there's fruit in being obedient to those urgings of the spirit. I would not have had that experience if I didn't heed the call to do that, even though it sounded ridiculous. In fact, my wife was like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know. I got to do this thing. She's like, okay. <laughs> and I did it. And it was beautiful. And there's nothing about it I regret doing. Okay. Leviticus 23, 27, or 26 rather, atonement. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, remember that, not Moshe said, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, on the 10th day of the seventh new moon is Yom HaKapurim, Yom Kippur. It shall be a set-apart gathering to you, and you shall afflict your beings, and shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And you do no work on that same day, for it is Yom HaKapurim, to make atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. For any being who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And any being who does any work on that same day, that being I shall destroy from the midst of his people." You do no work, a law forever, throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Underlining that as well. These were not done away. It is a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall afflict your beings. On the ninth day of the new moon at evening, from evening to evening, you observe your Sabbath. Okay. Now, that is the 10th of Tishri, uh, Atonement or Yom Kippur. Now, this is, harkens back to, or at least alludes to, the one day per year that the high priest uh, could and would meet with Yahweh, Yahweh uh, in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And fasting and prayer is the commanded tradition here. Afflict your beings. That's what it means. That's fasting. That's what it means. Afflict your beings means to fast. So you fast from sundown to sundown. And you pray. And you atone for your sins. Uh, this is repent, man. R&R, &R, rebuke and repent. And it's a lovely thing. I've done this, um, and I intend to keep doing it because a law forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. I dropped my pen. It's okay. I'll use a Sharpie. I'm not using a Sharpie in a Bible. That's stupid. Stand by. Ow. Oh. Love it. I'm alive. I don't know if I'm well, but I'm alive. Okay. So... Yes, very awesome thing. You do no work, you fast, uh, and you take a Shabbat. It, it's, yeah, it's good. It's deep. The spirit moves um, 
on the Day of Atonement. I always get awesome stories from people who are fasting and praying and reading the Word on Atonement, and it's super cool. Like, uh, I sit and wait for the text messages to come in, or the emails, or the phone calls, and it's super cool. Um, <clears throat> the readings for Atonement are Leviticus 16, Numbers 29, 7 through 11, and Isaiah 57, 14 through 58, 14. Now, the command to keep this Day of Atonement is repeated elsewhere. I mean, it's repeated in Leviticus 16. We can go look at Hebrews uh, 9, 17. Those of y'all who know me know my, my interesting relationship with Hebrews. Um, I think I wrote that down wrong. I don't believe it is Hebrews nine seventeen. That's talking about a covenant of blood, not about fasting. So that's my bad. <laughs> okay. Ah. Yeah, it's 917 in context, but it's really 924. For Messiah has not entered into a set-apart place made by hand, figures of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of our Elohim on our behalf. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters into the set-apart place year by year with blood not his own. For if so, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by offering himself. As, <clears throat> and as it awaits men to die once and after this judgment, so also the Messiah, having been offered to bear the sins of many, shall appear the second time apart from sin to those waiting for him unto deliverance. So we have a reference here to the high priest entering in uh, once per year, the Day of Atonement. So... That's Hebrews there, and it's really Hebrews 9.24, I would say. And then uh, the fulfillment here, or what we're looking for here, is if you turn to Zechariah 12. I know you guys are not happy with me, with all the flipping. But I just want you guys to see it yourself. See it yourself, assuming you can find Zechariah. Assuming I can find Zechariah. Not Ezra. Come on, man. Come on, fingies. There it is. Zechariah 12, 10. And I shall pour on the house of David and onto the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of favor and prayers, they shall look on me whom they pierced, and they shall mourn for him as he mourns for his only son, and they shall be in bitterness over him as bitterness over the firstborn. In that day, the mourning in Jerusalem is going to be great, like the mourning at Hadad Ramon in the valley of Megiddo. Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every clan by itself, the clan of the house of David, the women by themselves, Nathan by itself, and the clan of Lee by, it, by itself, and the women by themselves, and Simon, and all the rest of the clans, and so forth and so on. Um, why do I have this note in here? Well, I don't know, but I have this uh, in here. But the point here being that Yeshua becomes our high priest, our one day per year, uh, and the atonement. So that's that's what the Feast of Atonement is pointing towards, is Yeshua becoming our high priest. He is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So... Hmm... 
Boy, I'm trying to find this reference that I was looking for here. But I sure lost it. In that day, Yahweh shall shield the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the feeble among them in that day shall be like David and the house of David like Elohim, like the messenger of Yahweh before them. The messenger of Yahweh, by the way, is Yeshua in the Old Testament. And it shall be in that day that I seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I shall pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of favor and prayers, and they shall look on me whom they pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one who mourns his only son, and they shall be in bitterness over him as bitterness over a firstborn. So that's clearly Messiah. And Messiah is high priest, and that's what this Day of Atonement is driving towards here. Again, man, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't take longer to delve deeper into any of this, but we're coming up on uh, Sukkot here in um, Leviticus 23, and Sukkot is kind of a monster. <laughs> we just don't have the time, um, but... I would love it in the comments if you'd let me know if you want to learn more about these individual feasts. We can do a study of individual feasts. So now we get to here at Leviticus 23.33. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying on the 15th day of the seventh new moon is the festival of Sukkot for seven days to Yahweh. On the first day is a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. For seven days you bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day there shall be a set-apart gathering for you, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a closing festival. You do no servile work. These are the appointed times of Yahweh, which you proclaim as set-apart gatherings, to bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh, an ascending offering and a grain offering, a slaughtering and a drink offering, as commanded for every day. Besides the Sabbaths of Yahweh, and besides your gifts, you, and besides all your vows, and besides all your voluntary offerings which you give to Yahweh, on the fifteenth day of the seventh new moon, when you gather in the fruit of the land, celebrate the festival of Yahweh for seven days. On the first day is a rest, and on the eighth day is a rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of good trees, branches of palm trees, twigs of leafy trees, and willows of the stream, and shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim for seven days. And you shall celebrate it as a festival to Yahweh for seven days in the year, a law forever in your generations, celebrate it in the seventh new moon. Dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native born in Israel dwell in booths, so that your generations know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Thus did Moshe speak of the appointed times of Yahweh to the children of Israel. Okay, Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, the Festival of Ingathering, okay, booths. Uh, as Pastor Joe says, Sukkot is when God commands you to go camping. The 15th of Tishri, this is the seventh feast in the seventh month for seven days. Seven is the number of spiritual completion. What's 777 and his number is 777? Okay. And three means all in Hebrew. If you have three of something, you have all of something. So this is complete spiritual fulfillment. Total spiritual completion. The end of an age. This, is, this points towards the ushering in of the millennial kingdom when we dwell with Messiah. And so it points backward to when Yeshua, or I'm sorry, when Yahweh brought us out of Mitzrayim, brought us out of the bondage of slavery, okay? And it points forward to when we will dwell with our Messiah who redeemed us and brought us out of the bondage of slavery to sin. Okay. Sukkot is a party, <laughs> by the way. It's a blast. It's a good time. You do not hang your head and mourn and carry on if, as if, you know, somebody shot your puppy. It's a party. You, you carry on as if it's, uh, yeah, it's a party. Now, it's also 
very interesting to understand that the Jewish wedding feast is seven days. Sukkot is seven days. The wedding feast of the Lamb. The bride and the bridegroom. The bridegroom is Yeshua HaMashiach. The church is the bride. Wedding feast, seven days. Wedding feast of the Lamb, Sukkot. It all, the festival of ingathering, we all gather together. We're gathering in, we're reaping from the field. The last reaping of the field before the end of the season, it all comes together and we celebrate. Like This is all indicative of the millennial reign. Now, there are readings prescribed for this. There are many. So I will just give you the first day's readings, uh, but there are readings on every day during Sukkot. Uh, so you do read Psalms 13, 113 through 118 daily, you know, as we've talked about before. Then the first day's reading is Exodus 12, 31 through 51, Numbers 29, 12 through 16, and Zechariah 14. What's also super cool here, and what I wanted you guys to see, because this blew me away the first time I learned this. I mean, blew me away. The water libation ceremony is not something that most Christians have ever even heard of. But in the temple, when there was a temple, there was a ceremony called the water libation ceremony. Google it. Look it up. It was <clears throat> the ceremony of ceremonies at the end of the year during Sukkot. Okay? It was the fulfillment, the cap to the whole year. Because at the end of Sukkot, the year starts over for the Hebrews. Okay? The Torah reading resets. Everything goes back to Genesis 1.1. After Sukkot, okay? And the water libation ceremony, one of the priests would go out of the temple with a golden vessel and he would fill it up with water from the pools of Siloam. Siloam means peace, okay? The pools of peace. Who's the prince of peace? Uh, you may remember that Melchizedek was the sovereign, the king of Salem, which means peace, Siloam, Salem, Shalom, Asalam, right? Peace, 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 peace. Um, Melchizedek was the king of peace. Yeshua is the prince of peace. This golden vessel was dipped in the pools of peace, Siloam, and the high priest would return with this vessel back to the temple. And when he got back with this vessel, there was an altar in the temple. And there's two channels cut in the altar. And the priest, and there's people are going nuts. There's trumpets sounding. There's people shouting and cheering and singing. And like, this is the culmination, right? This is the, the end of the big festival. And the priest would get up there behind the altar and they would pour water and wine down the altar and it would flow out from there and this was the living water right that represented cleansing and it, the removing of sin right and this water libation ceremony was the thing like this was the highlight of the year as far as festivals go with that in mind I want you to turn to John seven thirty seven. Okay, go to John seven thirty seven. That's first John. What am I doing? Wrong John. John seven thirty seven. And on the last day, the great day of the festival, Yeshua stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me, and let him who believes in me drink. And the scripture said, Out of his innermost shall flow rivers of living water. And he said, Concerning the spirit which those believing in him were about to receive, for the set-apart spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua was not yet esteemed. Many of the crowd, when they heard the word, then said, This is truly the prophet. Others said, This is the Messiah. Okay? 
when Messiah stands up and says, drink of me, this is at the height of the most powerful ceremony and the most powerful feast of the year in this Hebraic tradition. It wasn't just at some little temple somewhere where he stood up. He stood up right in the middle of it and goes, yeah, that's cool. That's me. That represents me. I am that. And people got it. That was the context in which Messiah stands up. I'm getting goosey just talking about it. I'm going, that's me. I am that. And man, Matthew 5, 17, I came not to destroy the Torah of the prophets, but to embody it. He embodied that, right? It's, it's just incredible. And so Messiah is the water libation ceremony. How do we know that? Well, you can't, you can't navigate with that three points, right? So there's one right in the middle, right? Go to John 2. John 2. What is Messiah's first miracle? And on the third day, they were at a wedding in Cana, in Galilee, and the mother of Yeshua was there. And both Yeshua and his taught ones were invited to the wedding. And when they were short of wine, the mother of Yeshua said to him, They have no wine. Yeshua said to her, Woman, what is that to me and to you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, Do whatever he says to you. And there were six stone water jugs standing there according to the mode and the cleansing of the Yehudim, each holding two or three measures. And Yeshua said to them, Fill the water jugs with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw out and take to the master of the feast. So they took it. But when the master of the feast had tasted the water that had become wine... And did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom. Okay? Wedding ceremony. Bride, bridegroom, water, wine. It all tying together here. The water and the wine. The water libation ceremony. Anybody who's thirsty, come to me. And then John 19.34. John 19.34. And now we have we'll start at 30. Yeshua hanging on the stake, crucified. So when Yeshua took the sour wine, he said it has been accomplished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, since it was the preparation day, the day of prep, Friday, that the body should not remain on the stake on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high one, it actually wasn't Friday which is a whole nother story for a whole nother time. Body should not remain on the stake for the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high one, which tells us it was a feast day. The Yehudim, the Jews, asked Pilate to have their legs broken and, they, and that they be taken away. Therefore the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the others who were impaled with him, and the other who was impaled with him. But they came to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and instantly blood and water came out. Blood and water. The blood is the wine. The water libation ceremony. Anybody who thirsts, let them drink of me, Yeshua says. What does all of this point to? This is the millennial kingdom with Yeshua. Um... There's a lot of places we can go to look for this, but we can go to Revelation 21. It's one of the last, second to last, I believe, chapter in this book. Revelation 21. And I saw it renewed heaven and a renewed earth, which is Isaiah, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away and into the sea is no more. And I, Yohanan, John, saw the set-apart city, renewed Jerusalem, coming down out of the heavens from Elohim, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in the heavens saying, See, the booth of Elohim is with men. He shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim shall be with them and be their Elohim. We dwell in booths for seven days. Seven days is the wedding ceremony, and Yeshua is the bridegroom, the church is the bride and we have fulfillment of tons of prophecy through Yeshua with the water libation ceremony and the, the living waters and 
the blood and the wine, and it just all ties together perfectly. And so Sukkot points to the completion of an age when we all step into the millennial kingdom. This has not happened yet. We are not dwelling with Messiah. But we do that, A, to be reminded that he's coming, and it's coming, and we will one day, and B, to be reminded of the mighty hand of Yahweh who brought us out of the land of Mitzrayim and removed us from slavery. And so that is, in a very brief nutshell, as brief as I can make it, biblical feasts. A brief overview we covered a lot of ground. Um, please forgive me for all the jumping around. I can encourage you more strongly to keep feasts. Number one, we're told to do it. Number two, Yeshua did it. Number three, the Holy Spirit <laughs> descends during feast times as proven in Acts, Acts 2. Um, and number four, it's so fruitful. It's so powerful. And... It brings you into a deeper understanding of Messiah. It's so real. It makes it so real. Um, and Yeshua did this. The disciples did this. They all participated in this. And... My goal is to be as Christ-like as possible, knowing that I will always fall short, and in the falling short, I have the grace of my Messiah that I don't abuse, but I have it. It's available to me. And we're commanded. <laughs> Do these things, right? A law for all your generations and all your dwellings. That's foot stomped three or four times in that one chapter, Leviticus 23. So, if you guys want to do more study on individual feasts, let me know down in the comments. Um, I would encourage you to, again, keep the feasts and just start. If you don't know how, just start, man. Just Google some stuff, figure it out. And I, I really think that the Father sees and blesses an obedient heart much more than strictly following the rules and regulations. I mean, if you look at the, the chief argument that Messiah has against the Pharisees and the Sadducees is their legalism. How they've just made his Father's law a burden. And Yeshua understands the heart of a man and the heart of the Father and embodies that and does it. And that it's intent. What is your intent? Not, not did you perfectly check every box on the list. The Father is not a formula. It's not a mathematical equation to be unlocked with the proper stroke of a pen. It's the intent of the heart and seeking him and doing his things and he rewards that openly so yeah thank you guys for being here that's what i've got this week uh it's this is a beast of a chapter so thank you for being here for an hour and 24 minutes bless you guys love you guys shalom